What's up guys, Kudokun here, and today we're going to finally look at the Eldritch card game for real this time. Eldritch Kingdom is an indie TCG based on the works of Elrond Hubbard. So all the good stuff like horror and spellcraft are going to be here. The game itself is pretty easy to learn and understand, but there are some intricacies I'd like to go over, and I'd also like to give my thoughts on the game. As a small disclaimer, all of my images are taken from the Eldritch Kingdom official Facebook. So without further ado, let's look at a card. These are your basic combat cards, and these are the cards you'll be seeing the most often. Combat cards will have a number right here to show how much power they're worth. Above that number is a symbol representing the card's class. This dictates where the card is allowed to be played on the field. The last thing a basic combat card will have is its name. Some combat cards will be slightly more advanced. Here you'll see effect text in addition to the name. When Sepulcher's Risen is played on the field, you can draw two cards from your deck and add them to your hand. To help you keep track of card effects, there's a small symbol here representing what the card's effect does. Any card that has an effect will have a symbol like this above its class. This card symbol, for example, is a card with a plus in it, representing that you can add cards to your hand when you play this card. The symbol itself doesn't have any real significance, but it is used to keep track of what this card's purpose is in the game, and allow you to compare this card to other cards with similar effects. One last thing I'd like to mention is that some cards have multiple symbols on their class. For cards like this, you can choose which class they are when they're played, but once you've played them to a certain class, you can't change their class unless the card returns to your hand. In addition to combat cards, you'll also have spell cards, which fall into a variety of categories. This symbol here means that the card is a field spell, so it will stay in play once it's played and give a constant effect. The effect symbol above it in this case means that the effect is meant to lock away some kind of option. It makes sense here, because this card's effect is your opponent isn't allowed to play any heavy combat cards. So essentially, heavy combat cards are locked for your opponent. I didn't mention it before, but some cards will have white text like this at the bottom of the card. This is just flavor text and can be ignored for the most part, though I recommend reading the flavor text of any new cards you get, because lore and style are two of the main points of the game. The next type of spell we'll look at are instants. This will be a small culture shock to people who have been playing card games for a long time and believe that instants mean that the card can be played during your opponent's turn, but instants in this game mean that you apply their effect and then discard them instantly. If you're a Magic the Gathering player, think of them as sorceries, despite the name. Just like before, the card's effect and flavor text will be listed here. The last type of spell cards are traps. Instead of their effects being activated immediately, they're played face down, and when your opponent performs a specific action, the card flips face up and then takes its effect. In the case of Lord Kale's Rally Order, when your opponent plays a champion, you can flip this face up to draw three cards. Don't worry about champions, we'll be looking at them next. Finally, these are champion cards. Champion cards are the rarest, most powerful cards in the game, and you're only restricted to one per deck. Therefore, every competitive deck should include one. While champions are very similar to combat cards, you'll notice there's a lot more going on in the effect text box. Champions will have a special red effect text in addition to their black effect text. Right now, champions effect texts fall under two categories. Either they save your cards from dying, or they protect your cards from special effects. In addition to their regular effect and their beefy attack stat, these cards can single-handedly take on an army. Well, now that we know what the cards do, let's get acquainted with the field. Your in-play area will be split into four sections. You've got your close combat, your ranged combat, your heavy combat, and your spells. At the beginning of each game, you will draw 20 cards from the top of your deck to make up your opening hand. If you play other card games, this might sound a little excessive, but do keep in mind that you cannot continue to draw cards from the top of your deck like you do in other card games unless a card effect specifically allows you to. Do also keep in mind that your single hand of cards will have to last you multiple rounds of play. To be more specific, the goal of the game is to win three rounds, so your hand will have to last you three to five rounds of play. While 20 might sound like a lot at first, it might not actually be that much when you start playing. Every turn you can play one card from your hand onto its designated space on the field. This will raise your overall power. Right now we have an overall power of 2. During your turn you must either play a card or pass to your opponent. If you do pass to your opponent, you are no longer allowed to play cards for the rest of the round. Since you can only play one card per turn, this means you'll have to choose between whether playing a combat card or a spell card. Don't forget that if it's a trap card, it'll go face down in your area and its effect won't be activated until its conditions are met. Honestly, outside of that, there's not much to talk about in terms of rules. There's no combat and no chains, so there's nothing else to go over, really. What I'll do instead is give you a few pointers to give you a head start in competitive play. The first thing you have to understand is card value. Card value is an invisible number that every card can or should be worth. 
Unfortunately, this number is determined by the metagame in popular decks, so we won't have an exact number for right now, but since numbers range between 1 and 10 on combat cards, we'll just go straight down the middle and assume that every card value is 5. That means in order for a card to be worth putting in your deck, it should add at least 5 overall power for you, or take away 5 power from your opponent. If a card cannot do either of these two things reliably, then it probably isn't worth putting in your deck. I want to reiterate that we are only using the number 5 for right now because a metagame has not yet been established, but later on in the game's lifespan this number could really be anything. Understanding card value means understanding card interactions. Gluttonous Courtesan, for example, only has 2 power, so normally we would look over it, but it destroys one close combat card when it's put in play. Because it's capable of destroying a card with at least 5 power, and if we assume this is a competitive setting where your opponent will always have cards that are worth at least 5 power, this card's value isn't 2. Because we can assume that it can destroy one card on the field and that one card has at least 5 power, this card has a value of at least 7, making it much more powerful than a card with, say, 6 or 5 power. This might sound a bit complicated at first, but it's really not. Every time a card allows you to put a card into your hand from anywhere on the field, or allows you to destroy a card on your opponent's side of the field from anywhere on the field, assume that it's worth 5 more power for each card interacted with in this way. Since Courtesan can destroy one card on the field, we can assume that it's worth at least 7 points, because it adds 2 to our side of the field and takes away at least 5 from our opponents. Here's another example in Corpse. If we're just looking at Corpse's power of 0, then this card is obviously not worth playing. But when we play it, we can swap it with one of our opponent's cards and then put that card into our hand. If we assume that the card that we bounce is a value of at least 5, then we've gained 5 because it's gone to our hand, our opponent has lost 5 because they've lost it from their side of the field, and they've gained 0 because Corpse has no power. Corpse is a whopping base value of 10. That means running this card would actually be even more beneficial than just having something with a base power of 9 or 10. The same principle applies to spell cards that don't have any power. Tome of Anaximanus lets us take two cards from our discard pile and put them back in our hand. If we built our deck correctly, then those two cards that we take should have a value of at least 5, so this actually has a value of at least 10. Next I'll teach you about efficient loss. Believe it or not, learning when and how to surrender is actually going to give you the best benefit of the game. If our opponent is able to use one turn to put us 2-3 to three cards behind, or put them 2-3 to three cards ahead, passing and just allowing them to win that round might be more beneficial than trying to play it out, even if we have a way to come back. Let's say our opponent has just played Tombstone Priestess and destroyed at least two 5 power cards on our field. This puts us at a deficit of 10 power and raises our opponent's power by 1, so overall we have a difference of 11. If we don't have a single card we can play during our turn to make up that exact deficit of 11 or more, then sometimes it's better to just pass, give our opponent the round, and start fresh next turn. Even if you have a way to play out the field over the next two turns to make up that difference, if it takes you two turns to do it, sometimes it's just not worth it. Let's say you and your opponent both had five cards in the field when your opponent played this card. They now have six cards on the field, and you now have three. This also means, though, that your opponent has 14 cards in hand and you have 15 cards in hand. If you end your turn and your opponent ends their turn without playing a card, then the round will be over. Your opponent will still be at 14 cards in hand, you'll still be at 15 cards in hand, and you'll have an advantage going into the next round. And since you'll both be starting the round at zero power, there's no power differential of 11 that you have to make up. This isn't always going to be the case, but it's a very powerful play to keep in mind. Another term I'd like to teach you is overflow. Overflow means forcing your opponent to continue dedicating cards to a round they've already won. Let's say your opponent has 17 power and you currently have 8. You drop Cenotaph to put yourself at 16 power. When your opponent's turn rolls around again, your opponent is still winning at that 17 versus 16 power. So even though your opponent's already in a winning position, they have to continue playing another card to keep that advantage, because if they pass, then next turn you're guaranteed to win the round by playing something with at least 2 power. This forces them to drop something from their hand that they wouldn't have regularly had to if you had just passed the turn. This is a really fun mind game, and you might wonder why you don't just do this the entire game, but I'll teach you about that in the next turn we learn. For right now, the thing I can tell you is you never ever want to force something like this during the first or second rounds of the game. Once you and your opponent both have one victory under you, start abusing this because it's going to force your opponent to drop a lot of resources that they don't have and allow you to take a late game sweep. Again, before you and your opponent have one win each, do not take advantage of this because it's going to put you behind in the long run. The last term we'll talk about is Fluff. 
Fluff refers to cards that don't instantly give you or your opponent some kind of advantage or disadvantage, but rather do something like add cards to your hand or affect cards on your side of the field. Priest's Hand is a good example of a fluff card. If our opponent is trying to overflow us, like in the example I gave before, then having something like this in our hand is actually really beneficial. Instead of wasting a card to continue holding on to a power advantage that we already have, we can just play Priest's Hand to put two cards from our discard pile back in our hands. This means that we were able to play out a turn so we didn't have to pass, and when it goes back to our opponent, they're still behind us in power, and they still have to make up that differential. And when our opponent does make up that differential, they're actually going to take a card value loss. If we swap the positions of the example I gave before, then we have 17 power and our opponent has 16 power. On our turn, we play Priest's Hand to put two cards from our discard pile back in our hand. Going back to our opponent's turn, let's say they want to take the lead from us, so they decide to play something with, say, 5 power. If we were both on an equal playing field, that 5 power would have put a 5 power differential between us, but since we were already leading them by 1, that card is actually only worth 4, because we only have to play something of 4 or higher to match it or beat it. The best way to fight fluff is to have more fluff. Let's say that we do this example again, we play our priest hand to put 2 cards into our hand, and our opponent's turn comes around and they also play priest's hand to put 2 cards into their hand. Now that our fluff has been countered with their fluff, we're in the same position where we have to overflow. Because of this, you don't want to use your fluff until you have to. Just because you have a card that will let you put cards from your discard pile back in your hands or allow you to draw cards from the top of your deck, doesn't mean that you should play them immediately. What you want to do is save your utility cards for a time where you really want to pass the turn, but passing would allow your opponent to take the round. When that happens, you can play your utility cards to stall your opponent out to see what they do and make them play more cards. Again though, I want to reiterate that fluff and overflow are not things in the game until you and your opponent both have one win behind you. During the first couple of rounds of the game, you probably won't want to play any cards that let you return cards to your hand unless your opponent is really trying to force an early game. There is some more stuff I could talk about, but this video is getting really long, and I know you guys don't want to sit there and just listen to me prattle off a bunch of stuff about strategy in a game that I haven't even technically played yet. So I'm going to go ahead and start wrapping this up with a review. I first want to say that I appreciate the Eldritch Kingdom a lot. The lore and the artwork and everything is just so beautiful. You can tell that a lot of time, effort, and energy went into making this. They're the kind of cards that I would love to keep around just to show people, and because the game is so simplistic, I can easily bust out a couple of decks of this and just play it with people anywhere. I think the creators of Eldritch Kingdom should be really proud of what they've made. It's not the same dwarves and elves and dragoborns that we've been thrown recently. So, even if competitive players don't end up saying it, I really appreciate the effort that went into the flavor of this game to make it stand out from the rest. If a simple, beautiful card game is what you're looking for, then look into the Eldritch Kingdom. I'll be leaving links to the rulebook, the official tutorial, and also a link to the store page where you can look into buying it for yourself in the comment section below. Now that we've gotten that out of the way, unfortunately we have to get to the other half of this review. Now, keep in mind, my goal here is not to hurt any feelings. But one thing I'm known for is my brutal honesty, and unfortunately, there's a few bits of brutal honesty that I have to give. So let's get the big thing out of the way first. I know it's the thing that's on everybody's minds right now. This is Gwent. It's not kind of like Gwent. It's not Gwent-ish. This game is exactly Gwent. As my fans can probably tell you, I am not fond of this business practice of taking an already existing card game from a video game, a very popular game like The Witcher, and reskinning it and making it your own card game. I'll admit that my opinion of the game soured a lot when I looked into it and I realized what was going on. However, after doing a lot of research on the game, I'm actually going to turn a blind eye to it this once for two reasons. The first being that game mechanics and artwork have been added to this game to make it as unique as possible. I don't feel that this is in any way a cash grab. They didn't do the cosplay deviance thing of taking an existing card game, reskinning it, and then selling it exactly as is. They've added a lot of unique, interesting ideas from other card games, admittedly, like uh, Yu-Gi-Oh! I noticed with the field spells. And trap cards, don't forget trap cards. And overall, I can just tell by looking at everything related to this game that a lot of heart went into this passion project. It's not just a cash grab, it's an actual passion project, 
and that's the main reason that I want to see this game succeed. The second reason is that the owner of the card game is very open about the fact that it's Gwent inspired. If the owner weren't open to acknowledging that this game is Gwent, then I would absolutely tear them apart and I would not support them in the slightest. The owner is very honest, he's worked very hard to make this a unique card game, and I'm gonna go ahead and give it to him, and give him as much advice as I possibly can. There are some gameplay tweaks that need to be ironed out. There are some very amateur mistakes I see made here that are obviously just a product of the owner not knowing very much about the market. Again, that's not an insult. This is an indie game, so it's unexpected that the first season would go completely smoothly. The first being champions. Now, I don't care that the champions are as powerful as they are. If we're using the numbers I was giving before as a reference, um, this is 10, so it has the value of two cards. It destroys six cards when it comes into play. It makes all of your cards bounce back to your hand when they're destroyed. And as far as I can tell, it's not affected by cards that destroy combat cards. Now, I'm not complaining about this card because it's so powerful. I'm complaining about this card because each player is allowed to have one in their deck. Decks are 30 cards big and there is a 30% chance that one of the players won't end up with this. This is one card with the value of 8 cards at the very least. That's not even counting all of the broken interactions with returning cards from your side of the field to your hand. And in 30% of matches, my opponent will not draw this card. I do not see how a duel where one player has this in their hand and the other player does not have this in their hand is going to be a fair match. The best play I could possibly have when my opponent drops this card is to end my turn and let my opponent have the round to start fresh next turn. But once I do that, if I also don't have one of these in my hand, it's like my opponent at the beginning of the match automatically has one win. I just don't like this idea at all. I think if something as powerful as champions are going to exist, it should be something that both players are guaranteed to have. In my opinion, I think the rules should be adjusted so that each player, instead of shuffling these into their deck, starts with one of these face down in front of them, and then they can choose to play this as though it were in their hand. That way, there's no chance that one player just straight out doesn't have access to it. And since it's face down, our opponent still can't see what it is. Plus, that means our opponent and I are starting on 21 cards, and I really don't see how that could possibly break the game. Now, getting on to the card interactions, I do have to question how much playtesting went into something like this. If I have this card on the field, then any cards that I have that are destroyed are sent back to my hand. So if I play something like Wrath of the Gods that destroys all cards on the field, then what's actually happening is all of the cards on my opponent's side of the field are being destroyed, and I'm bouncing every single card that I control back to my hand. And since my champion's not destroyed, I just kind of win the round, and I didn't have to spend any cards to do it. This is, unfortunately, the problem we hit whenever we get to a game that doesn't have some kind of mana or cost system, is that without something to limit me from doing something like this, this is something that can be abused very heavily. And this is just one example. I'm sure there are other cards that let me destroy cards on my own side of the field to do stuff to my opponent, and in those cases, it's essentially just bouncing cards back to my hand and getting even more advantage. And this is all on top of the 8 card advantage that playing that one champion card already gave me, and the 30% chance my opponent doesn't have one in their hand, so they can't possibly win. One thing I'm also very concerned about is power creep. Here's a fun little power chart showing what you're capable of doing with certain enhance effects. So if I get three of these small one power guys in play, and I play the guy that doubles their power, then all of a sudden they're all worth two power. So what was essentially three got turned into six, and we have the two on top of that, so we have overall eight power. This is touted as something that's supposed to make us think strategically and uh, sort of encourage some deck variety because you never know what somebody will want to use for their enhance effects. But they're just cards that have 8 power. I can either go 4 turns playing the cards from before, or I can play this card by itself, have 19 other cards in my hand, and have the exact same power. Some could argue something like, well, what happens if this card gets destroyed? Well then, you know, you've put all your eggs in one basket, so you just lose all eight of that power. But I'm going to counter-argue that with why don't I just put four cards in my deck that all have eight power? 
In that same scenario, it's going to be easier and worth more in the long run. I also want to point out that this card is a common, you can tell by the black symbol in the top right. Something clever could be done in the future to make it riskier to play heavy combat cards, but if this game gets two or three sets down the line, I really don't see how this problem can be avoided. Like, be completely honest with me here. How am I ever supposed to get value off of this card? It's one power, it goes in the ranged, and it's the exact same rarity as the card that has eight power. The champion we looked at earlier destroys both ranged and heavy combat, so it's not like it's somehow better because it avoids certain effects like that, it seems like it's in just as much danger as the card before. It's kind of like in Yu-Gi-Oh how they have the two and three star monsters that are completely vanilla and have like 800 attack and 600 defense. It just seems like such a waste of talent because there's amazing artwork on this card, but there's nothing to incentivize me in playing it ever. It kinda sorta just seems like pack filler that's eventually gonna go in a binder and we're never gonna look at it again. This is the other problem with trying to break away from having like a color system or some kind of clan system or some kind of uh, archetype. If there were a deck that maybe made Murder of Crows uh, unable to be targeted by effects or maybe raised its power or maybe let me put it on my opponent's side of the board to steal one of their characters, that would be interesting, and I could build a deck around that, and I could have a crow deck or something that crow went into, but because there's no archetype, no colors, no clans, no nothing to encourage me to use something like this, this game is inevitably going to have a lot of trash in it. I'm going to say right now that there's probably going to be maybe 10 to 15 metagame cards that everybody's going to use in their deck, and then everything outside of that will be like maybe two copies of a staple that they personally like. Once people find the absolute best way to play this game, every single deck is going to look exactly the same, and if you don't have that deck, you just don't get to compete. Going back to Gwent, actually, this is a problem that they were able to solve by having five different archetypes of cards. You could play as cards from the monsters, you could play as cards from different kingdoms, each one had their own leaders, and the reason that there were trash cards like this is that in a video game setting, these cards are easy to get a hold of, and that's why they have value, because you can get a hold of them very easily. A card like the 8 power Heavy Siege card that we looked at earlier would have been a card that we had to do a quest to get, or had to pay gold to get, or something of the same. Since all these cards come in booster packs, there aren't any quests we're going to be doing to get them, so there's no reason for them both to exist. Next thing we got to talk about is pricing, and you guys knew I had to go here. I will say that $20 for a starter deck is not the most outrageous thing I've ever heard, but there are some things that we have to take into consideration. This is a deck of 30 cards from someone I've never heard of, from a studio I've never heard of, for a game that I've never heard of, and I'd say that the value of a 30 card deck in a card game like this is maybe $8 to $10 by itself. It also comes with a rule book, a small novella about the world, it's got a small card list that I guess I get as a downloadable after I buy the game, and also a map to add more flavor. For all of that extra stuff, I'd say that the value of the game is maybe at $15. Again, you have to keep in mind that this is an unknown publisher that I've never heard of for an unknown game that I don't even know if anybody will play with me. I really feel like $15 would have been the sweet point for a starter deck in a game like this. I think the creator included the lore book thinking that that would somehow increase the value of this up to $20, and honestly it could. I could see where having a really well-written lore book to read um, during some time off would be really nice to have, but I've also got to hit with some hard truths here. Very few people are going to actually care about that lore book. In fact, I'd say if 100 people bought decks from here, 20 of them, I'd say, would be a good number, would actually pick up the lore book and read through it, and the other 80 players are probably either going to put it on a shelf somewhere, or just throw it away, or something else. This isn't my feelings personally, alright? To me personally, I think something like a lore book is really cool. Um, I read all the instruction manuals to my games, I read all the little pamphlets you get in the Magic the Gathering fat packs, but I'm saying... The average player is not going to care about that lore book, so they're probably not going to be able to justify spending $20 on a set like this. 
Now, if we wanted to be really um, nice about it, I guess, or if we just wanted to say that this is marketed to people who really, really like the lore books, maybe we could bump that number up 40, 45%, but there's no way that every player or one out of every two players is going to be into this thing enough to justify spending the extra money on getting this starter deck. Now, funnily enough, there actually is a way to justify this being a $20 starter deck, all right? Hear me out on this. I have an idea for you. I think you should take this to heart. I really think you should include a small 10-card booster with every single starter deck. Hear me out on this, okay? I know that is putting more cost into this, but I actually have reasoning behind it. At the beginning of each game, each player starts with 20 cards. So if you give them 10 extra cards to work with here then they'll have 40 cards, so if they want to play this with their brother or their sister, or if they want to play it with one of their friends so that they can test it out, then each player will have 20 cards to play with, so this essentially becomes a two-player starter set, even though you can market it as a one-player starter set. If the person who buys your starter deck is able to play this game with other people, then it will encourage somebody else somewhere to also buy their own. And because the 10-card booster is randomized, they'll actually get their own little set of unique cards that are only unique to them, and maybe even they can trade those cards between the person that initially got them into the game. $20 for a 40-card starter is also a lot easier to swallow. The 10-card booster doesn't even have to include any really rare cards in it. Maybe make it like six or seven commons and then three to four rares. Or if you wanted to be really cool about it, you could maybe throw in like one very rare. And then, you know, they've even got their own little starter set of a collection that they can be proud of. If you can't do something like this, keep things the way they are, and I really recommend dropping to $15. $14.99, I could definitely see recommending this to people. $19.99, it's a stretch, because they could put that money into something like Magic the Gathering, Weiss Swartz, Vanguard, Pokemon, like anything else, and get more value out of it. The other thing that's on sale right now, boosters, it's $8 for 18 cards. On the surface, that sounds like a really good deal, because uh, a regular booster pack of cards is about $4, you get about 10 cards in it, so spending 8 here to get 18 isn't the worst trade-off. It's actually okay pricing. But you're also being a little bit tricky here. I see what you did there. Um, each of these booster packs has a chance of containing exactly one of the highest rarity card, if I remember correctly. Or it could even be guaranteed that you get one of the highest rarity card. <laughs> the problem with that is... If I were to buy two regular booster packs of another card game, then I would be getting two of those cards. So essentially what's happening here is more of, of the filler is being sold off, and it's actually harder to get your hands on the rare, more powerful cards. Yeah, I just double-checked myself. It's 15 commons, two rares, and one very rare or champion, which is actually even worse than I thought it was before. That is very... <laughs> That That's not very good pricing if you consider it that way, because 15 of the cards you get are going to be commons that you're going to be getting so many copies of, that if you do get dedicated into buying this game, you're, you're going to need the very rares and one of the uh, champions to compete, but in order to get them, you're going to have to buy like... Oh my god, you're going to have to buy like 40 or 50 booster packs just to get to a competitive place. And I, I really don't like that personally. Um, uh, I really, I really think you should tone down a little bit on the commons that you're giving out. Maybe like ten commons, uh, three rares, and then. No, wait a second. Yeah, no, like ten commons, maybe five rares, two very rares, and then like a champion in every pack. I know that might sound like a lot right now, but trust me, um, you're not guaranteed to get the champion you want. You're still gonna have to collect a lot of the very rares. I just. I feel like not having as many rares and very rares out there for people to trade amongst themselves or try and collect and buy is going to be detrimental to the card game in the long run. The one thing you don't want happening here is for there to just not be enough content out there for people to feel like they're getting to a competitive place and able to compete at a higher level and challenge people who have more money than them. Getting more competitive cards in the hands of players is going to help that. I want to address something here. I know some people are going to get on me for uh, getting on their case about the pricing, because 
we all know that um, something like this, where it's just an independent studio trying to make money, especially after they put all the time and effort into how great the artwork is, is going to need that extra money, and that's why it costs more. It's kind of like comparing why coffee at a mom and pop shop might be just as expensive as something at Starbucks or why something at a small store might be more expensive than going to Walmart or Target and getting the same thing. Because it's an independent process, um, you actually need more money for it to work. I completely understand that. I totally get it. Um, but we are being completely realistic here, okay? We are putting on our hard hats and just hitting the truth head on. And I think that you have to be competitive when you are trying to bust into the market with something new like this. Having okay to iffy prices so there's less cards out there and less players out there is going to be the number one thing that leads to this card game not going anywhere. Not saying it will, I'm just saying it's a possibility if you don't get enough people out there. I really wish we lived in a world where an independent studio like this could just make as much money as a big studio depending on how hard they worked. It's just not realistic. I also want to remind everybody that this game is self-admittedly based on Gwent, and Gwent is currently free to play on both your computer and on your mobile device. If I'm interested in Eldritch Kingdom, I can very easily go here, sign up, get a free deck of cards to start playing with, and start playing online for free, and then put that $20 I would have put into the Eldritch Kingdom into getting more cards here, because this is a place with an online community where I can just pull out my phone, have a match any time. When it comes to competition, this is a very, very difficult thing to compete against. I'd say that competing against something like this by dropping the price of your starter decks by $5 and by guaranteeing more rare and valuable cards in your $8 booster packs is actually being really generous. I've rambled quite a lot, we need to start wrapping this baby up, so to summarize everything that I was saying, despite my personal objections against the business model, I actually see something in this game. I see something that I don't see in a lot of other indie guard games, and that is potential. I see the potential for this to be a really fun thing to do at conventions, and for, a, for it to be a really cool thing just to collect. It's a really cool idea for a card game, and I want to see this game succeed. Either drop your starter decks to $15, Add 10 cards to your starter decks to increase player activity and to encourage more people to go out and buy decks of their own so they can get their own 10 card uh, booster pack with their starter deck. Um, and either lower the price of your booster packs or just give more rare cards. 15 commons is way too much for your booster packs. And that's about it. Thank you all so much for watching. If this game continues to do well, if the owner of it wants to reach out to me to maybe talk to me about this, I'm totally up to it. And if this video itself does pretty well, I see a lot of likes, I see a lot of sharing, a lot of activity, then we could even cover more of this game in the future. But for now, pleasant hunting, horror fans. Hey you, thank you so much for watching the video. If you enjoyed it, I'd really appreciate it if you left me a like. They help the channel grow and let me know that you want more of this kind of content in the future. The channel is currently being supported by these lovely folks on Patreon. You guys rock! If you have any thoughts on the video, of course leave them in the comment section below along with suggestions on what I should do next, but also answer this question to prove that you made it to the end of the video, if you feel like it. And finally, if you found this video by accident, then subscribe to stay up to date on the latest Kudo news. You can also hit the notification bell. Ringing the little bell will let you know when I upload a new video. See you next time!